I'm Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner, and you're listening to the True Philadelphia Podcast with Matt O'Donnell. Larry Krasner, a career public defender and criminal defense lawyer, beat six other candidates to win the Democratic nomination for Philadelphia District Attorney and then trounced career prosecutor Beth Roseman with nearly 75 percent of the vote in the general election in 2017. Now, when you hear about the city's rising homicide rate, you typically hear people directly blaming D.A. Krasner. His policies are unlike those of any other D.A. the city has seen and maybe even the entire country, save for a few other progressive prosecutors. Krasner recently announced his office's findings that the death penalty should be abolished in P.A. because it greatly and unfairly targets minorities and the poor. He offered convincing evidence, but the fact that it was coming from the city's top law enforcer made it seem strange. I was there. Krasner then invited me to his office for a lengthy conversation on capital punishment, whether his policies influence crime rates, whether his policies may discourage good policing, whether George Soros was the reason why he won the job in the first place, Krasner's future ambitions, and the 2020 presidential race. Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner on the True Philadelphia Podcast. Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner joins us here on the True Philadelphia Podcast in his office here in Philadelphia. Thanks so much, Mr. Dia. I'm delighted to be here in my office. Let's start with the one thing I always hear when people describe you, particularly in news articles, You are America's most radical district attorney. What feelings do you get? What thoughts do you get when you hear that? You know, I believe in free speech. If they want to say radical, okay. If they want to say I'm trying to get levels of incarceration back to where they were 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and that makes me conservative, okay. Let's talk about homicides. When you were running your campaign, and particularly after you were elected, which was a surprise to a lot of people, Uh, Don't get me wrong. The thing that I heard a lot from people who are your critics was that crime's going to go up. You're going to see it. In the first year, homicides reached a point they hadn't been in 11 years. Now, in all fairness, they were already on an upward climb. This year, at this point, compared to last year at this point, homicides are up an additional 5%. What level of ownership do you as a district attorney have to the homicide problem in Philadelphia and its rise? I think all elected officials, I think all officials, you know, I think are are my partners in the police department, partners in the city. I think we all have a responsibility to do the very best we can to try to improve these things. But I think we also have to be honest that the real issues here have more to do with poverty and they more have more to do with a lack of job opportunity. They have more to do with the fact that we have a dismal minimum wage and um, we have all sorts of other blights in the city, like a very low level of graduation from high school, than they do with whatever name is on the desk of the person in the mayor's office or in the commissioner's office or in my office. Do you have, do you have any acceptance of blame with your policies having led to a rise in homicides? Does one of those have anything to do with the other? So let's make sure we're clear on our facts. The, the facts are that the level of violent crime, and that total level includes homicides and includes shootings, which are serious issues. But the total level of violent crime is down. It was down, uh, it, right now it's down 2 to 3%. The total level of crime is flat. Earlier this year it was actually down 1% over the time when we came in. And even when we look at these homicide numbers, which are very concerning and we're very worried about, the fact is there was an uptick for essentially five consecutive years under different policies before we got here. So we need to be careful not to confuse things happening at the same time with causation. We've done a very, very careful study, and there has been an independent study of our bail policy that is clear. It didn't cause any crime. And when we look, and I have done this with the police commissioner, when we look at the motives for the homicides that we're seeing, as of the last one I saw, the real area of increase in homicides is drug-related homicides. It went the prior year from 60 to about 120 last year, while all other motivations for homicide remain the same. 
So think about it for a minute. How surprising is that? We're in the middle of an opioid epidemic, and the one area where we're seeing this big burst of homicides is drug-related. That's our challenge. That's what we have to go to, and I'm committed to do anything that I can to assist with that. But no, I didn't actually cause that by coming in and doing progressive things that have the long-term effect of making it possible for us to invest in ways that will, in the long run, reduce crime. Is the separation between homicides and other violent crimes where one's going up and the other going down, is the drug problem, the opioid problem, the primary motivator there, the primary factor? All I can tell you is that that is the data collected by the Philadelphia Police Department as of the last time I saw it. You know, I deal with individual homicides all, all the time, and I see what motivations are in many of them, but it's very dangerous to go on an individual case and try to interpret trends that way. What we do know is a trend that's alarming is that shootings are up. What I do know is a trend that's alarming is that homicides are up. They are not up, for example, uh, you know, significantly higher than the year before we came in as of this time of year, right? And they are not up compared to the end of the Lynn Abraham administration when they were about 40 more than they are now. And that's noteworthy because Lynn Abraham was the ultimate example of a mass incarcerationist. She was the ultimate example of someone who was so in love with the death penalty that she bragged about it. And those kinds of uh, draconian policies had the homicide rate about 40 higher than it is right now at this time of the year during her last year. So like I said, you know, we, we are going to see fluctuations, but we need to do the structural things, the things that build up education, they build up treatment, they build up all of the types of experiences so that 16-year-old boys feel that their lives have value and they don't just pick up a gun and start shooting. That is an enormous swing in public opinion for the DA, known as the deadliest DA in the United States, two elected DAs later, someone who is fighting to try and overturn the death penalty, have the legislature take the death penalty off the books in Pennsylvania, you, Larry Krasner. Well, you know, I guess I wouldn't say I'm fighting it. I'm, I'm just, what, all that I'm saying is when we look at the legacy of those approaches, not only during Lynn Abraham's time, but now we look a good 12 or so years later, I forget exactly how many years, but I think it's about 12 years later. What we see is it didn't work, you know? So when something doesn't work, you've got to try something else. And I think for way too long, conservatives and hard-nosed pro-incarceration people got away with claim taking credit whenever crime went down and saying, doubling down on mass incarceration whenever crime went up. Nobody called them on that stuff, you know? The reality is, in the long term, the war on drugs failed. Mass incarceration has made things worse, and we need to be open to trying other options. Let's talk a little bit more about the death penalty. As a lawyer, have you ever witnessed an execution? No. I can tell you that as before I was a lawyer, I was selected to and served on a death penalty jury. And I can tell you that as a lawyer, uh, I did participate as a defense attorney in uh, some death penalty homicide cases. I've had to, to, I've had to go through a process where, where, you know, I and my co-counsel are asking a jury not to execute someone. And as an attorney who is now a prosecutor, I've sat around a table with a bunch of people who are very, very experienced, and we've had to make the difficult decision of whether we should pursue the death penalty or not, what charge we should bring on a homicide case, et cetera. But have I witnessed an execution? No. And, and part of the reason is there has been no execution uh, in Pennsylvania, with the exception of Gary Heidnick. I was going to ask you about him. Yeah. 1999, right. the last person executed in Pennsylvania, House of Horrors killer, right. Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and not like many of the other people on death row. White, apparently somewhat wealthy, he was a stock market whiz of some sort, uh, but deranged man. Did he deserve to be executed, in your opinion? Well, he felt he did, and that's why he volunteered for but it. Did, do you? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I haven't studied his life. You know, that was pro I was probably a lawyer for two years at that time. I don't know all the ins and outs. I, I do remember him. He was a memorable person. Sure. He was a combination of, uh, you know, extremely mentally deranged, as you said, and he seemed to be pretty brilliant when it came to stocks. Somehow he ran up like half a million dollars in stock investments of, uh, of that type. Um, I don't know. I would have to study someone's entire life and really get into it. I, I, I view that differently, though, Matt, honestly. I view that as an interesting example of a case of assisted suicide because this is someone who wasn't just content with the bodies of others. He eventually concluded he wanted to add his body to the pile, and the state helped him. 
So I think he's pretty atypical when it comes to most of the people who are uh, given the death sentence. Your opposition to the death penalty seems purely on a case of fairness rather than morality. And, and, and I feel like you separate the two with a very fine line. Is that, is that the sense that I should have? Well, let me be clear. You know, uh, what happened today is my office was required on a deadline to take a position of whether we felt that the Constitution uh, would permit or not permit the death penalty. So what we were doing today was a legal exercise. I, I was not in there advocating for a particular bill in the legislature. I was not taking a moral position. You're absolutely correct about that. We were just doing our duty, which is we were looking at the law and then seeing what are the facts, putting the two together, and that's how you know that's how you bake the cake. That's how you see what the answer is. Is it healthy for the city of Philadelphia to have the district attorney at such odds with the head of the Fraternal Order of Police? Yes, if it's this one. I mean, this this head of the Fraternal Order of the Police has made it very clear that if there are black protesters outside of an officer's house, he's going to call them a pack of rabid animals or words to that effect. Where do we think this Facebook scandal comes from? Where do we think this level of toleration for physical abuse, corruption, uh, for racism, for hatred towards a particular faith, for misogyny, where do we think it comes from? So, you know, no, I'm not going to get on that team. I'm not going to be part of that. This office and the FOP need to stand for better than that. The FOP represents the rank-and-file officers, and you would assume that most of the rank-and-file officers support their union organization. Is there another way that you can reach out to the rank-and-file and feel like you have a better relationship with that officer who's on the street? So, Matt, let me tell you why I think that's not true. And this is based on conversations with a lot of police officers. I'm friendly with quite a few of them. Um, most of the membership of the FOP is actually retired. People don't know that, but they're retired and they're paying half dues or some kind of substantial dues. The 6,500 active members are the minority in the FOP. And so what you really have coming from the uh, all-white leadership, and it has always been white, the all-Republican leadership that endorsed Donald Trump and the FOP, what you really have is not the voice of current officers. You have the voice of the past. So, you know, so in that sense, is there a way to reach out to current officers? Well, we kind of do it every day because we work with a lot of officers um, I mean, it is correct that I was endorsed by the African American Officers Association during the campaign. We have a very friendly relationship, and frankly, their leader, Rochelle Bilal, just got elected sheriff in Philadelphia. And she got elected sheriff when John McNesby was telling everybody, don't vote for her because she and I work well together. That doesn't seem to have worked for Mr. McNesby. It would appear that his disapproval might get people elected. So I think the reality is that there are a ton of great officers who are in the department of every single background. They're modern. They're current. They want to do things the right way. And in many ways, they're being held back by uh, the voice of the past. Do you believe? I spoke to John McNesby, the Philadelphia FOP president, about this. He says his membership is about 50-50 active and retired police. But McNesby says that should not matter because either one will tell you there is no fear amongst criminals in the city anymore, police officers' hands are tied, and that there is no cooperation or dialogue between police and the district attorney's office. Those words from John McNesby. Do you believe your policies, what you say, what you do here in the DA's office, may lead to some discouragement amongst police officers on the street and cause them to not want to do their jobs to the fullest extent? Not the honest ones. I mean, you know, let's be honest about the Facebook scandal. It's only 330 officers. Uh, there are studied in total, right? Well, it's 330 they found who are doing really offensive stuff, right? There, were 6, 000, there are 6,500 current officers, and never mind the retired ones, but current officers. That is a tiny sliver. What is that, 5% or something? There, there are 19 out of 20 officers who were not found, and many of them are embarrassed. Many of them disapprove. They are not misogynists. They are not anti-Islamic. They are not people who think it's okay to run protesters over in your truck. You know, they disapprove of that like any good lawyer approves of a, a rotten, abusive, corrupt lawyer. So I think what we are doing is we are lifting up the best officers. I think that's what the commissioner is doing when he finds it necessary to, to bench some of those 330 officers. He's trying to lift up the best officers so they can rise, so they can become supervisors, so they can change the culture. And, I, you know, I'm more than happy to assist the commissioner in that regard. 
Ending mass incarceration was one of your top priorities during your campaign and now as DA. Is there a chance that you might have allowed too many out of prison and didn't put too many in prison? So the, I mean, the studies are, if we, again, it's always difficult talking about causation. This is what nobody really wants to admit about criminology, which is you can take the best PhDs around the country and you can give them a a particular issue, you're going to get some disagreement, you know. This is not that simple. But it's a lot more complex than the way we usually report it. There were 10,000 people in jail five or six years ago. There were 6,500 when we came into office. Right now there's about 4,600. During the period of time we've been in office, crime is flat. During the period of time we've been in office, violent crime is down. And when we look at a specific policy, like our policy on bail, which did result in a bunch of people people being out, and we look at those individuals, both we and independent academics concluded that it did not cause an increase in crime. In fact, there was a very tiny reduction in crime. So, I mean, I don't know how someone can claim there's a crime spike when there isn't. I don't know how we can... claim an overall violent spike when there isn't. Um, Yes, we have a terrible problem with shootings. We have a terrible problem with killings right now, and we have to do everything about that. But there is no evidence, there is none, to show that particular policies of ours are causing any of that. You beat six other people for the Democratic nomination. You, of course, won the general election. If George Soros, the billionaire investor, had never put that $1.45 million check to the PAC, would you have ever won? So um, I think the answer is yes, but I also want to be clear. George Soros didn't give me any money at all. And he had the PAC that supported you. He didn't, actually. The way that works after Citizens United, which was a U.S. Supreme Court case, is that people who do not work with your campaign, do not talk to you, have no connections with you, can spend money the way they want. They just cannot put it in your PAC. So not, there was no, there was no uh, you know, collaboration, there was no coordination, and there was no money that actually went into our PAC. All the money that we raised, we raised. Um, I, will, I will tell you this, and I'll just be as candid as I possibly can. The reason I think we would have won anyway is that there was a poll that was donated, and it was around three weeks out, meaning three weeks before the election. It was done, uh, if I recall correctly, by the Carpenters Union, and that showed us either in first or neck and neck with the person who was second. Uh, That was the only poll that we saw. We didn't have money for polls, but it was the only poll that we saw, and that was before all of the the support from the outside came, meaning there were television ads, there were mailings, there were were radio ads. Um, I believe that the effect of all of that is it made us win by a lot more, but I also think there's a very, very good chance that without any of it, since we had come from a very low position, we were clearly surging, the message was spreading, the press was trending our way, we were getting a lot of great endorsements, including getting some great labor endorsements, I think we probably would have won. We just would not have won by as much. In my mind, the reason we won was, was that we had a message that was resonating, and I could see that in public event after public event, what that extra money did, and it did do something, is it became like a megaphone. It just made it so that people... Tipping point. It, be, it, be, it just amplified it. It meant that our reach was much greater. We were doing great going into rooms with people who hadn't made up their mind, but this just meant that we got into a whole lot more rooms quickly. You were a public defender, a criminal defense lawyer, never a prosecutor. There had to have been a learning curve when you came in. Um, I was a I was a state public defender and then a federal public defender, which is a very different system. And then I ran my own law office for 25 years. Uh, it was a much smaller office than this one. This one is 600 people. So yes, there was a learning curve uh, in terms of some things. But understand, a busy trial lawyer, and I was a very busy trial lawyer, spends pretty much most of their time trying to figure out how the their, the other lawyer thinks about the case. Whether you're doing a civil case or you're doing a criminal case. If you're a defense lawyer, you're always thinking about how the prosecutor's going to handle their case and what evidence they have and how you're going to address it. So, and the same is true for good prosecutors. They're always thinking about, well, what's the defense attorney going to do? Are they going to say this is self-defense? Are they going to say this is voluntary manslaughter? What are they going to do? So in many ways, you're mirror images. You're always uh, trying to think like the other side thinks, and that makes it less of a, less of a learning curve. I will say this, you know, having handled probably more than 10,000 criminal cases in my career and a ton of trials, having been in court four days a week. There were little niche areas where I didn't feel like I was as familiar. For example, grand juries. Grand juries are not rooms where defense lawyers go. 
So dealing with that, I had to rely on the expertise of some other people. And then just managing an office of 600 when you've managed a much, much smaller law firm is a challenge. But at the same time, I had managed. And I had managed before. So there's, some of this stuff can just be scaled. I want to get your reaction to something that Philadelphia Com Police Commissioner Richard Ross said. And then he spoke after a particularly violent weekend. And there have been quite a few recently, unfortunately. He said of criminals who carry weapons in the city, some of these guys think they've figured something out relative to consequences or lack thereof. And many believe Commissioner Ross is talking to you. Do you have a reaction to the statement? Well, I actually have spoken to him one-on-one -on -one about that. And, and it, it's not that I called him up and said, what the heck are you saying? We were just at a conference uh, not so much later of a bunch of p police chiefs and their chief prosecutors. And, um, you know, what he explained to me is that he was asking a question about consequences generally. He was not saying it must be the DA's office's fault. He was saying, I would like to know what's going on in the courts. I would like to know what's going on in the DA's office. I would like to know why it is these, you know, these people do not feel consequences in general. But, you know, in my mind, he was also talking about the reality that 16-year-olds don't really consider consequences. That's not just my opinion. That would be pretty much the opinion of any parent who's had a 16-year-old, which I have, and the opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, it is so much their opinion that they've said we cannot execute juveniles. They've also said we can't even give them life sentences because they're just not capable of that kind of consequential thinking. So I think he was getting at a few things there. But I also have to tell you, um, you know, I respect the commissioner. I think he is a modern thinking person. We have exchanged data. And often the impression that, you know, one particular department has of another department may not be borne out by data. We've looked at our data. We have been more aggressive more aggressive than the prior administration in going after gun cases. That's the fact. They used to dump 3% of them. We dump 2% of them, which means we are pushing hard on 98% of them. And if we actually look at our results on things like homicide cases, our results are excellent on homicide cases. So, you know, there are times when people are operating off of impressions or ideas or particular cases they've seen and they don't see the big picture. We are trying as much as we can to provide the big picture and be transparent, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to continuing to work with this commissioner. Philadelphia U.S. Attorney William McSwain is someone who has been openly critical about uh, uh, plea deal decisions being lenient on defendants. These are his words, charged with lesser crimes, and he's accused you of being more of a legislator than the law enforcer of Philadelphia, saying that you've overstepped your bounds in what your office entails? Well, legislator might be the nicest thing he's ever said about me. Um, Mr. McSwain is a Donald Trump appointee. He considered one of his life's achievements to keep gay people out of the Boy Scouts. Uh, he comes from a very, very different philosophy than mine. We simply do not agree. And the fact is that the real career of McSwain has been to defend white-collar criminals in big-time federal cases. He's not that familiar with street crime. He doesn't know that much about it. Uh, the feds only prosecute about 7% of all criminal cases in the U.S. The state prosecutors do the other 93%. And I frankly think what he's doing is political. It's a deliberate effort, and we've heard this also out of the mouth of the president. It's a deliberate effort to go after DAs in Chicago and Philadelphia to soften up those jurisdictions that are important for Donald Trump's reelection, and, and I believe he's using Bill McSwain to do that. U.S. Attorney William McSwain, speaking at our 6 ABC studios just a few days after Krasner's comments, called Krasner's policies a failed experiment leading to a public safety crisis in Philadelphia and decimating police morale. I hosted a forum between you and Beth Grossman during the campaign right before the general election and uh, for Inside Story on 6ABC. And at some point, you mentioned that you yourself have been a victim of a crime. And you got into a little bit of detail. I was wondering if maybe you can recount what happened. And it was some type of mugging on the street. You were cutting your face. Yes, I'm happy to do that. So, uh, you know, what happened, and I won't go on and on, um, but what happened is I was uh, near my law office, which is in Center City, on a weekend. I was meeting with a client on a case where I was, you know, it's just a young kid. I was kind of cutting him a break. And as I exited in the afternoon to go home to be with my kids and to make them dinner, um, there were a couple people who were right near where my truck was parked in a, in a back street, like an alleyway. Um, and as I came around there, to make a long story short, 
I ended up being attacked by the two of them, which obviously, you know, especially because I'm not exactly Mike Tyson, was kind of a challenge to take on people coming from two different directions. By the time it was over, I had been slashed above my eye, across my face, um, with something I never saw, although the doctors thought it was probably a razor blade or possibly a, a sharp box cutter because the, the cut was so deep and so clean. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it was a lot of stitches, and it was a real rough time. I mean, I didn't. I think I was in the hospital about 12, 14 hours, and um, my kids didn't exactly know where I was because my wife was out of town. She's a judge, and she was teaching other judges. So it was a bad. It was a bad time. Simply put, did it change your perception, your feelings about people who are victims of crimes? I mean, that happened a long time ago. You know, this was 10, 12 years ago. It certainly helped to inform me more. You know, I'd been a victim of a burglary. I had been a victim of, a, you know, people breaking in my car. I'd had a bicycle stolen. So what? That's just not the same thing as being um, slashed across the face with, with something and then not even knowing you're bleeding, not even knowing you're cut until blood starts to pour down and, and somebody has to walk you a couple blocks away into an emergency room. It's just, it's a thing. Uh, it certainly informed me. I wouldn't say it ever changed how I felt about it. I've always had, you know, very high regard for all kinds of people. I know that a lot of victims sometimes are charged with crimes. I know that a lot of people who are charged with crimes have been victims. Anybody who's in this system knows that. And I know that some of these wounds they suffer are pretty hard they're pretty hard to get past. But, you know, in the same way that we say a defendant is not the worst thing he ever did or a perpetrator, um, I would like to think that most victims are not defined by the worst thing that ever happened to them. And if that's how they feel, then we need to do everything we can to assist them. And that doesn't just mean promising them vengeance, because there is a real question of whether wounding other people heals your wounds. That means doing what they need, giving them the, tr the treatment that they need, the assistance that they need. That means really going to bat for victims instead of just using them uh, for political purposes. So what do you think about this perception some hold that you care more deeply about defendants than you do victims of crime? Um, honestly, what I think about that is it's a convenient political narrative. I, I think it's also an aspect of culture change. If you, know, if you have been engaged with victims' issues for a long time and you've actually come to believe that what is going to make a victim right is the death penalty or is a sentence of life without any possibility of parole with no treatment, with no prosecutor trying to give documentation and police discovery to a civil attorney who might be able to get some compensation for those victims. If you honestly believe that that's all that victims want, then I don't think, frankly, you've talked to too many victims, because I have. And a lot of them are looking for something that will actually make them whole in other ways. A lot of them are looking to make sure that the person who did that to them will not do it to others. But they know that most people get out, so what they're looking for is some kind of treatment for the person who did it to them so that others will be safe. A lot of them just want a coherent story about why this happened and how this happened and what is the background with all sorts of those things. A lot of that I never got because the people who did it, who did that to me, were not caught, right? So I never really got to understand, were they driven by drugs? Were they driven by mental illness? Were they really trying to rob me? Because they did run off with my phone after they cut me, only to throw it away a couple blocks away. Or did they run off with that phone just so I wouldn't call 911 right away? There are a lot of things that victims want. And what they don't want is to be used for some headline that some ambitious chief prosecutor is trying to generate so he or she can run for governor. Um, there's just more to it than that. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that we have over a million dollars now, and it's never happened before in this office, dedicated to representatives who go to the homes of families when someone is murdered and try to help those families intensively for the first 45 days. There's a lot more we can do, and we want to do it. But, um, you know, we're just going to have to break the narrative that caring about victims means basically doing nothing for them except putting somebody in a, in a jail cell forever or seeking the death penalty. What's your relationship to social media? Uh, I'm sure you, you get some accolades. I'm sure you get attacked constantly. Uh, you know, I really wasn't that active on social media before, and so personally I'm not that active on social media now. It is necessary for a fossil like me to remain in touch with, uh, you know, younger people or people who are just more tech savvy. And so there are people who work in communications in the office uh, who will put up videos or, or they'll ask me if I have a comment on something and, you know, I will take out a crayon and scratch it on a piece of paper 
and then they will go and use a I think they call it a keyboard and they'll type it in there and they'll put it out so we do communicate but um, I don't pay too much attention frankly about what is said for or against I think it's pretty clear what I ran to do and I think given that I was elected with more votes than any DA in the last 20 years and I don't say that to brag but I just say as an index of, of what people wanted I think I should pretty much stick to what it is that people wanted and not ride the wave of my daily ups and downs according to social media. Do you have any ambitions beyond this four-year term in the DA's office? Well, I'll be back for another term or two. You know what someone told me today before our conversation? What's that? You're going to run for mayor in four years. Um, well, that is news to me. So I'll have, to, I'll have to find out whoever made that decision for me. I just wanted to throw that out. I know it's, well, it's you, a long time off. You can keep throwing it out. <laughs> uh, why is Philadelphia such a violent city? We've seen cities like New York uh, been able to reduce crime at levels that are, uh, it doesn't become a news story every week, every other week. You know, I think experts on this, like everything else, could disagree. But let me just point out, the average home price in Manhattan is $1.2 million. The average home price in Philadelphia is about 140000 Do you think that when you got to pay a million two for a house, that might drive some poor people out of the city? Do you think that's possible? God knows there's plenty of New Yorkers committing crimes. They just happen to run hedge funds, do it on Wall Street, and get away with it. You know, the reality is when you have a town that is poor, and Philly is the poorest of the ten largest cities, the type of crime that you're going to see will not be gentrified out of existence. All right? That's just the reality. So I think there's no question that uh, some of Philadelphia's violent history, and it is a long and violent history, has to do with the fact that it has had a declining economy. Not right now. I mean, right now our economy is ticking up, and I think that's wonderful. And our population is ticking up a bit, too. But if you look at the last 50 years, after textiles left the city, you're looking at a declining population. You're looking at an economically declining city, which is part of the reason that you can get a house for $140,000 in Philly. That's, that's the average house. Um, but you're looking at factors that just don't apply. I mean, even in Oakland, they talk about all these miracles in Oakland. And I, I love Oakland. The average house price in Oakland is 740000 bucks. There just are not that many people who are running around with guns on street corners who are living in houses that cost $1.2 million or $740,000. So I, we need to look at those factors. And yes, New York, you know, New York law enforcement will brag all day long about how they're so smart they did this. Eh, it might have something to do with the price of uh, the price of housing. It might have something to do with the economics there. Possibly the most famous New Yorker right now is President Donald Trump. He's running for re-election in 2020. If the Democratic Party called up District Attorney Larry Krasner and said, how would we be able to beat him, what would you give them in a snap judgment piece of advice? I'd say don't nominate Joe Biden. Uh, pretty much anybody else is going to win. Uh, you know, this is actually probably the most despised president of my lifetime, and I lived through Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, despite being a burglar uh, and a, a mad racist, Richard Nixon was a statesman compared to this dude. I think the reality is that this country is overwhelmingly against him. We should not forget that even when he won, he lost by three million popular votes. The, I mean, look at Pennsylvania, right? He wins Pennsylvania by 40,000 votes. Well, here's the news. Donald, when we had our little DA's race in an off-year election, 50,000 new votes came out. That was an off-year election in one city in a big state, and 50,000 new votes came out, and you won by 40,000. So Pennsylvania is not going to be yours, and there's a number of these other states that are not going to be yours, and you earned it. You've been very generous with your time. I want to ask you a couple more quick questions. Uh, number one, what keeps you up at night? Oh, what keeps me up at night? Um, <clears throat> or are, are you able to sleep? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I sleep less than I used to, that's for sure. I think it's the same thing the commissioner talks about. You know, it's the reality that um, it is our obligation to do everything we can to try to deal with violence. And when you hear about shootings and you hear about killings of young people, it makes you sick to your stomach. You wish you had a magic button you could push and, and you could end all of this. But you have to look for the long-term solutions. Long-term solutions actually work, and they do not work on a political schedule. Because what every politician is looking for right now in Philly and statewide is the ability to put their name on a program or to say, I spent half a million bucks on a thing. 
even if it's the same thing that didn't work 20 years ago. And we can't do that. We have to be willing to say, hmm, maybe it's a problem that this is a state that has a, you know, it has the, the federal minimum wage, which is a poverty wage, and all these other states don't do that. Maybe it's a problem that we've got the upstate legislature knocking down various forms of public assistance that are essential to the survival of poor people. Maybe that has a lot to do with crime, and maybe the fact that you can go into Chester County or Montgomery County, and they're going to spend twice as many dollars per student on their public schools. Maybe that fact explains why it is we have half of our kids not even graduating high school, feeling desperate, and picking up guns when they're 16. We've got to look for the long-term solutions. We've got to be willing to invest in those things. And the only way I know to do that is take all that money out of something that does not work, which is jails. What is the best thing going in Philadelphia right now? Oh, man. What's the best thing going? I mean, we have this tremendous influx of uh, excited young people. I thought you were going to say that. We do. We do. We have this tremendous influx. Um, They have left the silliness that is New York for a wonderful place, which is Philadelphia. And they are bringing a ton of talent, a ton of energy. They're bringing values that are oriented around doing things they believe in, that are oriented around sharing as opposed to, let's say, you know, the values around the movie Wall Street, which would have been closer to my younger years, right? Um, And I think those people are going to do amazing things. They're already doing amazing things in terms of how they vote, uh, and they're doing amazing things in terms of our economy. So to me, that's, that's really exciting. What I see here is a Philadelphia that has changed profoundly from when I was, uh, let's say, I was maybe 12 years old in 1973. You're from St. Louis, right? <clears throat> I mo- we moved to the area from St. Louis when I was about nine uh, years of age, so I remember living through, you know, some of, some of the Frank Rizzo era. I remember what that was like. I remember what that felt like, and this is a different town. This is a new town, and that's one of the great things about people. It's one of the great things about cities. They can, they can profoundly change in ways that are really positive, which is what I feel. Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner, thanks for joining us on the True Philadelphia Podcast. All right. Thank you. It's great talking. We thank District Attorney Larry Krasner for his time. Please subscribe to the True Philadelphia podcast. We have a wide variety of interviews from people in politics to people in sports to people who simply are changing the conversation in Philadelphia. You can subscribe right now on Apple Podcasts and leave me a message on what you think on my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. I'm Matt O'Donnell. Stay true, Philadelphia. Philadelphia.